Christopher Columbus, one of the great European heroes, turns up on the island of Hispaniola. He was welcomed by the native people. They embraced them, they treated them with fantastic hospitality. His soldiers snatched babies from the breasts of their mothers and dashed their heads against the rocks. Children were fed alive to his dogs. Women's breasts were cut off. He decided to hang 13 of the Native Americans in Hispaniola to recreate the crucifixion of Jesus oh, plus the apostles. It's true that the majority of people died there of disease, diseases introduced by the Europeans unwittingly, but many others were driven to death through overwork, direct murder, through starvation as their resources were taken away. Columbus insisted that everybody bring him a certain amount of gold and those who failed to do so had their hands cut off. Some were sent back to their villages with their hands and their noses tied round their necks, having been amputated by his soldiers. And what he did there set the pattern for the genocidal extermination of almost all the Native American peoples. A hundred million before Columbus made landfall, by the 19th century that had come down to less than a million across the Americas. Overtly endorsed by such revered figures as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who wrote about the necessity of wiping out Native American peoples. In Britain, we present the colonial project as being about teaching the natives table manners and double entry bookkeeping. In India, the British manufactured a famine in the 1870s, out of nothing. There were food surpluses, massive amounts of food, but the governor, Lord Lytton, insisted that this food be exported wholesale to Britain. The ensuing starvation killed at least 12 million people, possibly as much as 29 million people. All relief works were banned except for hard labour in labour camps, where the inmates received the same rations as the inmates of Buchenwald and where there was a 94% death rate per year. This was all done in the name of liberal free market capitalism. Of course, the British did something similar in Ireland. In Kenya, soon after the Second World War, there was an uprising by the Kikuyu people who wanted their land back. The Kikuyu were herded into concentration camps and fortified villages, almost the entire population of over a million people. People were systematically tortured to death. They invented a new kind of pliers whose purpose was first to crush men's testicles and then to cut them off. They raped women with bayonets. They raped men. Similarly, a favoured technique was to ram sand up the rectum with a stick. Sometimes they were rolled up in barbed wire and kicked around the compound until they bled to death. Some of the British soldiers boasted about this. This is within living memory. The colonial secretary lied about it. The papers documenting it were burnt. The impact of the rich and powerful nations has been so phenomenally murderous and destructive that it has been completely airbrushed from our national consciousness. In order to justify the land-grabbing colonial projects, you had to create an ideology. We, the Europeans or the Americans, have come to rescue the rest of the world from its depravity and backwardness. But in order to do that, you have to be able to demonstrate that the rest of the world is depraved and backward. From this arose the racism that is still with us today. It was a necessary component of the colonial project. Some people might claim, well, OK, we broke a few eggs to make this omelette. It's as if all those human beings were eggs. But look at the omelette. Isn't it fantastic? Look, we've made this fantastic omelette. Forget about all that unpleasant stuff and let's just celebrate where we are. Where we are is a continuation of the project. We commodified people's land and people's labour and turned it into our property. We're also destroying the rest of the living world alongside it. We don't have to be like this. We are the same human beings as anybody else. We're all part of the same big human family. We just have to recognise that, accept that. And of course, within Western countries, there are plenty of brilliant people resisting colonisation, both internal colonisation within our own countries and external colonisation of other people's countries. These are the voices which must come to the fore. Those who emphasise altruism and kindness and generosity and empathy for others. Those who recognise that skin colour 
and any other difference of language, of religion, of background is completely irrelevant by comparison to what we share, which is our humanity.